So I often saw Anita Sarkeesian as this sort of barometer for how much crazy you would say with a straight face and just have people nod in agreement, like you're making some sort of thoughtful and insightful point. I think that the media helps to shape our attitudes and beliefs and value systems. And so what does it say about the, you know, our society when the primary means of conflict resolution in most of these major games are about violence? But the reality is this barometer, this lemon test, has pretty much been scraping along the ground of late. That is, her channel, which now regularly does these hangouts, is greeted with apathetic disinterest. Her channel in total pulls in less than 5,000 views per day. Seriously, this is one of Time's top 100 people of the year of 2015, and all she really does is make YouTube videos, and she struggles to get a couple of thousand of people to watch them. Hell, she even gets Hollywood stars, well, <laughs> kinda, Will Wheaton on, and she still struggles to get a couple of thousand views. And the cute irony there is, yeah, that's the same Will Wheaton who wrote the Anita's Top Person Time article. And this is sort of the reason why I drifted away from criticizing this sort of financially elected queen of YouTube feminism. Not because what she says is any less crazy, but because it was only really relevant when she was getting widespread support from many sectors. Sure, it's entertaining to make fun of some of the crazy stuff she says, but you gotta be real. If you're making this out to be some great threat to Western civilization, <coughs> liberalism, then you might be overestimating the threat from the blue-haired feminists. So yeah, when there were feminists getting millions of hits on crazy videos, it kinda made sense. Now, honestly, not so much. And honestly, I also kind of like making the more interesting random videos like, you know, how when trilobites were alive, they actually had stone eyes or or the Doolittle Raid or hell, why a boiling kettle actually makes more noise before it boils. Now, someday I will actually do a final video on the rise and fall of Anita Sarkeesian because it is actually quite interesting, but that day's not today. Because we all know that this, this idea that video games cause violence was, was just crazy, completely unsubstantiated, and no sane person could possibly repeat it today. Well, welcome to the year of crazy 2018, where it's not Anita Sarkeesian blaming video games for violence, uh, but President-elect Donald Trump. I'm hearing more and more people say the level of violence on video games is really shaping young people's thoughts. I think that the media helps to shape our attitudes and beliefs and value systems. And so what does it say about the, you know, our society when the primary means of conflict resolution in most of these major games are about violence? And then you go the further step, and that's the movies. You see these movies, they're so violent, and yet a kid is able to see the movie if sex isn't involved, but killing is involved, and maybe they have to put a rating system for that. Plus, in an unusual double whammy, he also endeared himself to the Second Amendment proponents by proposing that you didn't need due process to take their guns away. Any weapons in the possession or of that individual. Or might take the firearms first and then go to court, because that's another system, because a lot of times by the time you go to court, it takes so long to go to court, to get the due process procedures, uh, I like taking the guns early. And of course, it was his vice president who he interrupted to say this. And his vice president nods away while he's saying all of this stuff. And then, of course, for good measure, he's putting all this wonderful stuff out there, like trade wars are actually good and easy to win. Oh, if only someone could have warned us that having an idiot for president might be a bad thing. However, there is an interesting twist to this uh, Anita Von Trump crossover. Because it turns out Trump's also doing stuff that will help Anita. So you'll recall that a year or so ago, I showed that the 501c3 feminist frequency was violating its tax-exempt status by politically campaigning against Trump. Now, the reason that's an issue, of course, is if you're a charity organization, you don't pay tax. And in turn, you're not allowed to play the game of politics. Well, that same law applies to churches. Yep, churches get tax-exempt status. And in return, they're not expected to politically campaign for stuff. Sure, you can get involved on issues, just not overtly backing candidates and that sort of thing. It was called the Johnson Amendment. And guess who vowed to destroy it? It was the great Thomas Jefferson who said, the God who gave us life gave us liberty. 
Jefferson asked, can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Yep, this is a sermon by Mr. All Wives Matter. Among those freedoms is the right to worship according to our own beliefs. That is why I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment and allow our representatives of faith to speak freely and without fear of retribution. Well, actually they can. All they've got to do is give up their tax-exempt status and they can say whatever they want just like anyone else. You know, I'm just not so sure why people with faith and uh, church should get tax breaks so they can be political activists. Moral equivalency to develop between right and left. It's not right versus left. It's right versus wrong. Let me ask you this. Where's the moral compass in America? It should be the pulpit. It should be the pastors. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. You cannot stop me from dreaming. Early word on President Donald Trump's executive order on religious freedom is it doesn't go far enough. Many Christians want a full repeal of the Johnson Amendment to prevent the IRS from going after nonprofit organizations or churches. Yeah, that intolerable imposition on free speech that if you choose to apply to be a 501c3 and not pay any taxes, you're not allowed to play the game of politics. From participating in political campaigns and endorsing candidates at the risk of losing their tax exempt status, critics say the measure's true power takes away free speech. Pastors and churches should be able to, to speak about whatever. Tumor fell to the platform. I mean, it fell to the platform. We saw it with something else, and it broke in pieces right. as it hit the stage. Their, the tenets of their faith, you know, direct them to speak about. And it's estimated his ministry brings in more than $200 million a year, mostly based on his pledge that you will be healed. If you have enough faith, the government shouldn't be paternally trying to protect churches from being divisive. Rather, uh, the government should stay out of the church's affairs. Well, I've got good news for you. All you do is renounce that tax exempt status and you can advocate for any candidate that you want. So yeah, um, that would kind of save Anita's bacon here. Oh, 2018, you crazy year. Except wait, what's that? Trump claimed that he's revoked the Johnson Amendment? by executive order? Well, actually not so much. It turns out the president just can't cross laws off the book just because he says so. He needs Congress to approve that. So it turns out all he did was actually write a letter to the Justice Department asking them to go easy on churches that violated the law. And oddly, it's stuff like that that bugs me more. Because last summer, I spent about a month driving around America. Okay, we're in that part of America. But the roads are very empty and you have precisely oh no, two radio stations one of them being pilgrim radio and the crazy religious stuff was everywhere in america blue head crazies not so much or just take a look at the funding this is just one church it's estimated his ministry brings in more than $200 million a year, mostly based on his pledge that you will be healed if you have enough faith. And this is one of the most high-profile, well-financed feminists on YouTube. And she got about a million dollars, which is a lot of money, over three years. And seeing as we got this far, I thought I'd just see how much Anita got for the last year. And checking out her annual report, Apparently, she pulled in about $400,000 last year. But when you actually look at the details, it sort of tells a somewhat different story. First of all, there was $100,000 of corporate donation. Just quite, who gave them $100,000? I'm not sure, but I would love to know if they thought they got value for money out of it. $200,000 was their Women in History Kickstarter. That's half of their income isn't going to be repeated next year. 100,000 was actual individual donations. But when you take a look at their expenditure, the whole thing just becomes comical. They spent $90,000 on fundraising costs. $90,000 asking people to give them money. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And I'm not going to put this in the Patreon supported feed because it's more just a, 
a little social comment type thing. But if you want to support this channel, because YouTube these days just seems to have this habit of habitually demonetizing every goddamn video that I put up, which is like, okay, fine. But when you're demonetizing things like uh, trailer by eyes and the Doolittle raid, it's just bloody crazy. Now, I appeal most of these, and most of the time it comes through okay after a day or so, you know, once the video's done, most of it's traffic on. But then sometimes they just get randomly demonetized again with no chance of appeal. It's weird. So Patreon really does help with supporting this channel and providing it with a buffer against these erratic changes of YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously. Trailer by Eyes got flagged as unsuitable for advertisers.